right, you squares. <laughs> As Tina Marie would say, down to square biz. Continuing with the Lucifer Principle, the theory of individual selection and its flaws. Richard Dawkins' theory is a powerful tool for cracking the mysteries of the cosmos, but it has a limitation. In reality, genes were never the loners Dawkins makes them out to be. Though Oxford Don, though the Oxford Don labels them selfish, even he is forced to admit that genes were compelled to coagulate in teams, just as their minions from termites to humans would later be. Current evolutionary history, known technically as neo-Darwinism, says that preservation of his genes is the first priority of the individual. Preservation for himself, his children, and for his remaining relatives. And as the examples in previous chapters show, when it comes to children at least, that view is largely right. Yet it is missing something vital in the human experience. When Rudolf Valentino died, numerous women committed suicide. Survival for themselves and their immediate families were the last thing on their minds. Underlying the notion of genetic selfishness is another, even more basic assumption, the theory of individual selection. When it comes to picking and pruning, says this concept, evolution sorts creatures out one at a time. Hence, the most potent, potent impulse is the makeup of every micro and macro beast is the drive for personal survival. But somewhere deep inside, e inside, each of us knows that individual survival is not the only raison d'etre. So thoroughly is the fact built into us that we find it in our physical structure. We come complete at birth with an arsenal of survival weapons, but we're also equipped with devices that can aid our existence. These are our self-destruct. These are our self-destruct mechanisms. In 1945, the Japanese had been fighting American soldiers for six years. They had known they could not lose. Their gods had made them superior people. They had swept through China and the Pacific Islands in the 30s like an avenging wind, taking vast territories, conquering hordes of inferior peoples, showing, showing the heaven-given supremacy of their race. The enemy who faced them was a contemptible lot, unblessed by the divinity that buoyed Japan and crippled racial impurity. Yet the mongrels from the West were accomplishing, accomplishing unthinkable things. They were beating down warriors of Japan. By the time the Americans reached Okinawa, the Japanese could see that heaven had deserted them. The shame was unendurable. 4,000 Japanese killed themselves in Okinawa's underground naval headquarters. Another 30,000 military men and civilians threw themselves from a nearby cliff. On the Japanese homeland, pilots volunteered to keep the American Marines in Okinawa from getting supplies. Those flyers were promised honor and death. Their mission was to guide their planes to the enemy and stay at the controls as the explosive laden aircraft slammed into the enemy's ships. I will be doing my duty by dying, they wrote in their final letters to their family. 15,000 of them fulfilled that fatal obligation. One commentator describing the kamikaze experience 40 years later after the fact explained, Japan is a society of groups. and not individuals. To us, the kamikaze's ultimate devotion seems baffling, ailing, 
alien and something that could never happen here. But it has happened here. Patrick Henry was declaring his loyalty to his fellow revolutionaries and their cause when he said, give me liberty or give me death. He was confessing that the social organism of which he was a part was was more important than his own existence. Suicides in 1929, the year of the Great Crash, tended to be flamboyant and highly publicized. There was the head of the Rochester Gas and Electric Company who asphyxiated himself with his firm's chief product. The two stock speculators who flung themselves off a New York City roof hand in hand, the investor who poured flammable liquid on himself and lit a match. In fact, there's a lot of that going on now. I was just reading about a couple that jumped off that jumped off a crane or something like that to their desk because they're in debt. So this still does happen. But these were exceptions, not the rule. Once the Depression hit its stride in 1930, 31, 32, and 33, however, the number of suicides, look at this, skyrocketed. In 1932 alone, it tripled. The, the men and women who killed themselves contributed very little to their own survival of that of their closest relatives. If you look at the, if you take a peek at the opioid scan, the opioid crisis right now, what's causing it? It's not the drug. What's causing it? It's the economic downturn and people losing hope. So this behavior that he's describing is very apparent in human behavior. It ha it's still happening. It continues to happen. It's a feature, not a bug. Back in. 1897, the seminal French sociologist Emile Durkheim compiled a list of t statistics that demonstrated the rise of self-inflicted deaths after market crashes of 1873 and 1882 and coined the term altruistic suicide. Durkheim seemed to sense that beneath the surface, the suicide was destroying the suicide was destroying himself to rid the wider society. Look at this. The wider society of a burden. Sociologists and ethnologists, uh, Marcel Mauss, uh, a relative and follower of Durkheim, was even more specific. He noted an occasional a violent negation of instinct for the preservation of, so of the social instinct. If our actions are geared toward increasing the odds that our personal genes or those of our near relatives will make it into the next generation, what is the reason for, su for suicide's existence? And what about the other bits of death in life built into the human psyche? Why do humans get depressed? Why do they feel like crawling off a, into a corner and dying? There is an answer, but it doesn't quite square with the notion of genes fighting themselves no matter what. We are part of a larger organism, and occasionally we find ourselves expendable in its interest. This idea is not very fashionable at the, at the moment. Evolutionists, myself included, believe that competition is vital to the creation of new species. The beasts with the bigger brain, the sharper claw, or the cleverer way of building a nest outdoes his or her clumsier rival and has more children. His offspring inherit his advantage, cranial capacity, neural, uh, natural weaponry, or architectural skill, and in turn have plentiful broods of their own. Plentiful broods of their own. Within a few hundred thousand generations, the creatures with the anatomical or mental advantages have, have outbred their dull-witted or blunt-pawed rivals. Less favored creatures may easily find themselves extinct. According to the current evolutionary party line, this competition makes takes place between individuals. The idea that it could occur between groups has been resoundingly dismissed. 
the reason a chain of arbitrary twist in the history of evolutionary theory the concept of evolving life dawned long before the publication of Charles Darwin's theories in roughly 580 BC Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus declared that life had not been created by gods but had emerged by natural means from water 2300 years later enlightened thinkers like Francis George Buffon reinterpreted petrified oddities formerly dismissed as stone tongues and dragon's teeth the objects the audacious naturalist said were parts of fossilized creatures from a previous era using the latest theories of geology buffon and his fellow icon iconoclast demonstrated that placement of fossils in the rocky strata suggested primitive creatures had occupied the earth far before the supposed biblical date of creation and have progressed to increasing levels of complexity as they moved from their birthplace in the seas to footholds on dry land. Meanwhile, Pierre Louis Moreau, Dave, <laughs> I'm hating these French names, Marc Partuis, another scholar who preceded Darwin by a hundred years, worked out a remarkably prescient theory explaining how advances from one species to another might occur. Even Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus, anticipated his younger relative by more than half a century by putting forth an evolutionary overview in his 1796 Zoomania. Zunamia. But it was Darwin's meticulous fact-gathering his family connections and his methodical campaign to win over the scientific community that finally reoriented the thinking of specialists and laymen alike. Darwin kept a checklist of influential thinkers. Then he used his social ties to bring them on board one by one. As a, as a result, Darwin's 19, 1859 origin of species created a splash so great that his propositions were even the subject of newspaper cartoons. 27 years earlier, Darwin's evolutionary thinking had been thrown into high gear when a book called An Essay on the Principle of Population brought the young naturalist's attention to the hyperactive output of replicatory system, of the rep replicatory system. The essay was the work of Robert Malthus, okay, we all know who Malthus is, do we not? A pessimistic English clergyman who proposed in 1798 that food supplies increase at a sluggish arith arithmetic rate while the population explodes in a geometric progression, making mass death through starvation inevitable. Population excess of this magnitude, Darwin concluded, would create competition for survival. And the creatures best suited to get the most out of a hostile environment would be the contestants who survive. Hence, nature would prune her flock like breeders of sheep near the Kentish country home where Darwin did most of his writing. These careful squires selected for reproduction only the animals that were the hardiest and produced the most wool. A culling of this sort performed by nature, if continued over eons of time, will produce radical changes in species. Because of similarities between methods of gentlemen farmers and the less tender mechanism of competition in the wild, Darwin dubbed, dubbed that the results for, of the battle for survival, natural selection. Darwin saw competition occurring at, s at several levels among them, between individuals and between groups. When discussing ants, he acknowledged that the evolution could easily induce individuals to sacrifice, look at this, sacrifice their self-interest to that of the larger unit. His later writings propose that a similar process occurs amongst 
human beings. In the 1930s, a new school of population geneticists led by men like J.B.S. Haldane and C. Wall Wright cranked out mathematical theories which gave evolutionists the sense that they were making the climb from Darwin's mere observation and speculation to the high scientific ground normally occupied primarily by those most envied practitioners of discipline of the discipline physics physicists excuse me the popularity of Haldane and Wright's algebraic hypothesis grew despite a substantial flaw they were not strongly supported by empirical evidence equally disturbing each of the formulations seemed based in large in large part on the premise that individual that the individual is the basic uni unit of evolutionary change competition between groups had been shuffled off stage In 1962, the Scottish ecologist V.C. Wayne Edwards, a careful observer of his country's native red grouse, concluded that these birds sometimes sacrifice their reproductive privilege in order to keep the flock from star starvation. The red grouse, Edwards contended, since that the amount of food the moors could provide each year and adjusted their behavior accordingly delaying breeding when supplies looked meager or even opting for total chastity the interests of the group concluded that was overrode the those of the individual uh, we saw something similar in the mouse utopia when the amount of mice became uh, too overcrowded you saw that the behavior of the mice changed it wasn't about breeding they stopped breeding um, they fought each other uh, even the female mice stopped having babies so there is something to this it's not something that's just uh, fanciful thinking or just theory that we have observed this um, if there's no food supply, um, your biology, a woman's biology is tied to the amount of fat that she has. If she, there's no food and she's too skinny, she won't ovulate. And she won't ovulate till there's enough food to where she can actually, uh, it's assured that the baby can survive. The backlash to the University of Aberdeen professor heresy was immediate and intense. Scientists like G.C. Williams and David Lack declared that group selection was all but impossible. The august theorists like W.D. Hamilton and R.L. Trivers explained away the altruistic tendencies. Wayne Edwards had described, had discerned by generating a new mathematical system. The theory of kin selection, which said that individuals would only sacrifice their own interests in favor of others if others if the others in question were relatives creatures who contain similar sets of genes in other words self-sacrifice represented an individual individualistic gene selfishly protecting a copy of itself selfishly protecting a copy of itself The newly constructed theories of individual and kin selection were hailed as a major achievements as major achievements and it became biological dogma. Wayne Edwards carefully reasoned theory based on decades of fat gathering in the field was tossed aside as disreputable as a disreputable aberration. So the Scot Scotsman spent 14 years in the heather gathering fresh information tabulated the resulting statistics and then printed the conclusions in his 1986 work evolution through group selection the book was virtually ignored
However, in the late 80s, an uneasy sense that evolution may not be limited to the level of individual organism or gene showed signs of inching towards science's peripheral vision. Stephen Jay Gould puzzled over the fact that there's too much genetic variation. More than one statistically expect if gene, if, if gene were subjected to natural selection. Some genes, he concluded, seem to be invisible to selective pressures. Competition between groups could, could account for the conundrum since the, less, since the group preserves a wide variety of individuals capable of surviving on their own. But Gould sidestepped considering this notion, this option, excuse me. Though he was forced to acknowledge that not all selections takes place at the individual level, he contended that selection transpires below that level between gene fragments and above that level between species. Gould assiduously avoided mentioning the possible importance of, so of social groups. California State University's David J. DePew and Bruce H. Weber, on the other hand, asserted forthrightly that a group can be considered as an individual and that the population level remains primary as a unit of selection but their brief observation buried in a buried in a work on, on, on an unrelated subject went unnoticed E.O. Wilson in his Keystone book Social Biology cites numerous examples of behavior in which individuals sacrifice themselves for the good of the larger whole. But current theory continues to explain these away by claiming that members of the group who give up their lives to protect brothers, sisters, and cousins who share bits of the ge same genetic legacy. Much of the enthusiasm over the theory of kin selection comes from W.D. Hamilton's brilliant mathematical demonstration of how genetic relatedness might account for the cohesion of bees, wasps, and other hominent, I'm not even going to try it, Hy hymenoptera in a hive. However, recent evidence shows that the 1964 notion doesn't always mesh with the real world. Tropical wasps live together in a cooperative Tropical wasps live together in cooperative colonies and function as a social unit. Most of the females get most of the females become workers and give up on having offspring of their own, working not in the interest of their own good or of their kin, but the, in the interest of the group. Yet they do not show the high degree of family relationship predicted by Hamilton. Human beings are a cooperative group. They are a cooperative species, just like wasps. I keep saying that. In many cases, human beings who willingly form squadrons, march off and fight to the death, have no genes in common at all. What he's saying. In fact, during the American Civil War, relatives squaring off on opposite sides did not protect those who shared their genes. They threatened to destroy them. Even more damning, women in, murders, in a murderous frame of mind usually do away with their own children. Says researcher Donald T. Lund, almost all inf infants who are killed are killed by their mothers. These mothers wipe out the very offspring who would carry their genes into the next generation. The next favorite target of married women is their husband or lover. And these grim facts of life are not restricted to the United States. Murderers in the USSR. Hong Kong and Britain show a prediction for killing those who share their genes. Human beings are a complex group. I mean, you know, signs of women that who are not in their right mind choose what men over their children. 
Sometimes they choose their own survival over their children. So it's so basically it's complex, but we're going to get to the heart of this. Kin selection selectionists have a found, have had a difficult time explaining yet another mystery. Why among some social animals, a few members of the herd will stand up and shriek when a predator approaches, even risking even at the risk of making themselves obvious to the predator and becoming his first meal. A herd of Thompson gazelles is grazing quietly in an open East African field. A hungry leopard approaches quietly from downwind, holding its body low in the tall grass. Suddenly, a gazelle raises her head, cocks her ear, and freezes. A snapping sound has aroused her suspicions. She looks around. She spots the silhouette of the leopard's head. What does she do? To enhance her own survival and that of her genes, her best strategy would be to move to the center of the herd, making herself as unobtrusive as possible. The leopard would then pick off some unsuspecting and unrelated creature on the herd's periphery. The gazelle's worst approach, on the ha other hand, would to be to draw attention. Research shows that the predators almost invariably go for a herd animal that is acting different from the rest. But the gazelle who has just spotted the clawed creature does not quietly bend, blend into the bunch. She breaks into a strange run, punctuated by an abrupt jump into the air. Her behavior alerts her herd mates to the prowling cat. One after another, they join the running and jumping. The leopard, thrown off track by the commotion, eventually gives up and walks away. The Thompson gazelle is not alone. Social animals of all kinds, mammals and birds alike, shriek, thump, or jump to warn their companions of impending attack. Every one of the shriekers takes the chance that his or her warning gesture will make her the first victim of the hunter's assault. The theory of kin selection says jumping and thumping is protecting their relatives. In a small number of cases, this hypothesis has worked out brilliantly, but in many others, it's it's been a failure. The large numbers of animals do not just consist of brothers and sisters and cousins. In fact, mobs like flocks of birds that migrate thousands of miles each spring and fall seem to contain very few close relatives at all. Yet members of the flock still shriek a warning when a hungry raider approaches. Why do these creatures choose to make themselves conspicuous? A stealthy meat eater will have an easy time creeping up on a group whose members dare not act as lookouts for their neighbors. That social bands days on the savannah are numbered. But the aggregation whose participants court destruction by shrieking up is prime for self-defense. An occasional individual may suffer, but the group will live to face another day. Individual selectionists have made a heroic effort to deal with the problem of altruism. Via the concept of kin, via the concept of kin selection, but there is a more subtle challenge to the primacy of personal survival they haven't yet dared to ta tackle. Intra punitive behavior. In the 1950s, psychologist Harry Harlow at the University of Wisconsin wanted to see how necessary the love of a mother and friends were to humans. He couldn't wrench baby newborns from their mamas and raise them in isolation cages, but he could do the next best thing. He tried an experiment on newborn monkeys. Simians raised without social contact frequently sat in the corner of their cage, curled their tail into a ball, their eyes staring empty into space and chewed on their own skin, gouging themselves until they bled. This is intrapunitive behavior. 
Um, remember he mentioned that about, um, uh, and I think in, in the opening when he said that um, if you take a baby and separate it from the group, a human baby separated from the group, it would be a, a baby that was introspective, couldn't speak, and basically a uh, it would sit in a corner in a ball and be a, a physical and psychological mess. Here's where he's proving his theory. And it has been proven about from what they call um, uh, what they call wolf wolf children. They've noticed, and they've also noticed that with uh, uh, orphans in Russia. And right after World War II, when a lot of the fathers were killed, there was a lot of baby orphans, you know, huge amount of baby orphans, right? And they noticed that there weren't enough people to give social contact to these uh, to these babies. And they grew up psychologically damaged. In fact, a lot of them failed to thrive and they actually died. Lots of them actually died. So human beings are a social animal. When you feel like kicking yourself around the block, you're in the grips of intrapunitive, of the intrapunitive force. At times, whole herds of humans have unleashed this, this impulse in an orgy of self-punishment. Remember the, the uh, Japanese uh, soldiers jumping off a cliff. Once a year during the festival of Moram, the Shiite men of the Middle East parade through the streets pulling out their hair, lacerating their scouts with swords, and cover themselves with their own blood, even injuring themselves with wounds that kill. Occasionally, the imagination can cooperate with the intrapunitive emotions to make the mind a living hell. Some extreme Christian fundamentalists see demons and Satan lurking at, in every shadow. Their imaginations have created creatures that constantly threaten to torment them. The slightest slip from the true path they feel can send Satan's minions writhing through every vein of their body. These visions of dancing demons do little to enhance an individual's survival or that of his genes. In fact, during the first thousand years of Christianity, many of the devout swore there was one sure way to avoid Satan's seductive embrace, chastity. A few castrated themselves Others withdrew, withdrew to the cloister and swore off sex forever. Most of these died, died childless, the monks and the nuns. In a sense, there are demons lurking in human flesh, ready to explode with activity. They are biologically built in self-destruct mechanisms. The, a talented advertising executive in New York was suffering from an unusual problem phobia of cancer no he didn't have cancer but his fear of it had practically incapacitated him one night he called his friends at 3 a.m. in a panic convinced that numerous vessels in his brain had hemorrhaged that blood that the blood was filling his sinus passages to the point of fatal explosion finally one friend took him to the emergency room of the local hospital where he was diagnosed as having a minor virus that gave him a stuffed nose. The next day, the executive fell into a panic again, certain that his nose was about to burst and kill him. Something was running rampant through his psyche, tormenting them, this man, but it wasn't a physical disease in the standard sense of the term. The tormentor was a set of self-destructive processes that wait within us for their daily for their day of use. In case of the man with the cancer phobia, the day of use had arrived, in part because his career as a successful executive had come to a sudden halt a year okay, a year earlier when the company for which he had been working shut down. Wayne Edwards demonstrated that red grouse on the moors of Scotland compete with each other at the beginning of the season for territory, 
The winners end up comfortably fed and mated, but the losers usually die of predation or disease. The deaths, say, says when, are the after effects of social exclusion. In the body, each cell comes equipped with a mechanism for what scientists say, call programmed death. An intrinsic cell an intrinsic cell suicide program researchers at university college in london say must be actively restrained from going into action by positive feedback indicating the cell is necessary to the larger organism when a hospital patient is forced to spend months in bed seldom uses his legs Many of the leg constituent cells sensing that they are no longer needed dwindle to mere shadows of their former selves. Others disappear. When a human spends weeks or months in a space, his or her heart no longer has to labor, has to labor mightily, pumping blood upward in the def defiance of gravity. The heart shrinks dramatically as the cells that no longer deem themselves of value scale down to existence just one step removed from death. An individual cell in the social superorganism, when he feels he is no longer necessary to the larger group, he too begins to wither away. As we'll see more clearly in a few chapters down the road, demons driving the ad exec mad were circuits of social disposal, intrinsic suicide programs similar to those that remove cells whose lives are no longer needed by the larger social beast. If our instincts were solely geared to the survival of ourselves and our relatives, such internal demons would not exist. And that is the end of the portion what was it called the theory of individual selection and its flaws uh, it's a dense it's a dense book uh, bear with me I hope you do get something out of it because each just like just like a math book, each and every piece is vital. So some things may not seem to fit or you, they might not be as explosive as you might think. But down the road, the pieces start to uh, fit together as a not only a narrative, but as a framework for a theory. So with that, I'm going to cut out of here. I'm going to post this up and we're going to keep hacking at this till we get through the whole book. Anyway, I'll check you guys later. This is BGS out.